Amen, amen, amen. And we're back. Praise the name of the Lord. It's another Friday. But for those who might be watching by recording, it may be a Saturday or Sunday or Monday, Tuesday, whenever it is. I bless you in the name of Jesus coming to you through this camera because I know that there is no distance in the spirit. So we're going to go ahead and get started for another awesome teaching. And you know what's crazy? This is an eight week series. Um, and this is week six. This is week six. This is week. <laughs> I need to be careful with this mic because sometimes I'm like, ah, scream out. Um, and I'm like, wow. Okay. So we're going to have to start praying now. I'm seeing your, oh, yay. That's my girl. Woohoo. Indeed. Let's go. Let's go. I'm going to have to start praying now. What's the next thing? Put it in the comments. What's the next thing you'd like to see from Rise Up and Remain Ministries? Um, this week, we are talking about fear and anxiety versus faith and peace. And here's a disclaimer. It might go a little longer than normal because this is one of my, not only one of my favorite topics, but it's also very relevant and prevalent, and it needs to be addressed today. Um, <laughs> she said, I don't know, but keep it coming. Praise God. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Here's the thing. Um, I've heard more in the last, I don't know, five, six, seven years, especially with this last pandemic that we had <laughs> last pandemic. Well, it was since the, you know, 1920s, 30s. I can't remember when the last one was, but it's like, anxiety is at an all time high, and it's becoming normalized. And I've, when I hear my sisters and brothers in Christ go around saying my anxiety, I'm like, the devil is a liar. Stop claiming that there is no my anxiety. God has not given you anxiety. You know what he's given you. But before I keep going into it, let's pray. <laughs> because <laughs> I'll jump right into it. Let's pray in. Let the Holy Spirit continue to lead and guide us. Open up our ears, heart, minds, and souls. Father God, I just thank you right now for your goodness, your grace, and your mercy. Lord, I thank you that I just submit my mouth, my heart, my mind to you, that every soul who is listening in will also be submitted to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. Open up our spiritual ears, Lord God. Take out the worldly wax that's clogging our ears to hear clearly from you on this teaching, this day. There's a divine appointment to hear this word in the moment that they hear it. Remove the scales from our eyes to see, Lord God, not only what it is that you want to show us, but also the tactics of the enemy that we will not be ignorant of his devices. I thank you, Father God, that you protect this airways, this Wi-Fi. You make the connection strong, Lord God. There's legions of angels that surround this teaching that your word will go forward and will not return to you void. We just give you all the glory, honor, power, and praise for this teaching and many more to come. In Yeshua's name we pray, Jesus' name we pray. We say amen and amen and amen. I know I can hear you. I can hear you in the spirit. There's no distance in the spirit. I know you're there. So let's get into it. Okay, so we are talking about fear and anxiety versus faith and peace. Um Yes, thank you. It's like, you know, I'm going to figure out how I can get your your comments to come up like right in the moment. I'm going to work it out. God's going to work this out. But we're talking about fear and anxiety versus faith and peace. Now, the reason why I had said before that this <clears throat> might go a little bit longer than others is because I actually taught this out in... Um, we were having like works. We did this whole workshop series over the summer about two or three years ago. Um, we would have different seminars and workshops and everything. And this was one of them, faith, um, faith over fear. And the thing is, is that when I was thinking about it before, I was like, you know what? Holy Spirit, we need to bring this back. Because even though some of you who might even be watching, you might remember when I taught that workshop, when I taught that that faith over fear workshop. And so some of this will, will, will be really good reminders coming back to you like, I remember that. I remember that because this is something that's going to be a continual battle that we're going to have to keep going on. So we're going to kind of tackle, you know, really break this down. This will be most likely a type of video that you're going to have to watch 
multiple times. This will be a teaching that you're going to have to put on pause, break out your notes. If you don't typically come to these types of um, YouTube videos or lives with your notebook and your pen and paper, this is going to be one of them that you're going to want to do that. Um, I do put up notes in the like the little my notes right up front here, but there's going to just be some takeaways you're going to want to write down. You're going to want the Holy Spirit to remind you of as you're facing some of these battles. So let's just jump into it. Let's just jump into it. We're first going to go with our first kind of knife, if you will. How does the Bible define fear? How does the Bible define fear? The two Hebrew words we will focus in on in the Old Testament for fear. The first one is yah, yare, yare, meaning both a moral reverential fear as well as a dreadful, terrifying fear. So these are, there's two Hebrew words. So because there's Old Testament references, the Old Testament is in the Hebrew and then the New Testament reference and the New Testament that we read, the base foundation, it is Hebrew, but it got translated into Greek. So what we know the Bible is Greek in the New Testament. So I'm giving you Hebrew, right? So the Hebrew word for fear is yare, um, meaning both moral a reverential fear, as well as a dreadful, terrifying fear, and a rats, pronounced ah rats. <laughs> so it's really like ah rats. It's, you gotta have this, this in the back of your throat. <laughs> ah rats, meaning to truly be in fear that causes one to tremble, dread, and inspire terror. Now, there are two Greek words. These aren't the only ones, but this is what we're going to be focusing in on. There are two Greek words in the New Testament for fear, which we'll focus on for our teaching today. The first is D or dilea, dilea, that's how it's pronounced, dilea, meaning timidity, fearfulness, and cowardice. Now, surprisingly, dilea is only found one time in the Bible, and that's in 2 Timothy 1 and 7. 2 Timothy 1 and 7, for God has not given us a spirit of dilea. That's where you're going to find that. But one of power, love, and a sound mind. Some translations here I put in the CSV says sound judgment. So God hasn't given us this dilea. The second word in Greek is phobio. Phobia, where we get our Latin root word of phobia, meaning to be afraid, struck with fear, to be seized with alarm, startled, also to mean a reverence that causes one to treat with deference and or obedience. This word is found over a hundred times in the New Testament. So it's more common when when you think about a reverence fear that causes one to treat with deference or obedience. This is like the fear you had of your parents growing up, right? Fear of getting in trouble if you, you know, got the wrong grades or you were sent home because you were talking in class or you're causing trouble or, you know, you're sneaking in the house. That fear of your parents is only comes from a reverence um, and a obedience to your parents or the lack of, right? That's that's that um, phobi, phobio, phobio fear. So interestingly to note, what I really don't want it to be missed on you is that the Bible clearly defines what faith is. We'll talk about in Hebrews. It clearly says this is what faith is, but throughout the word, you will never find a definition of fear, only instructions of what not to fear. Now I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you some, some knives. I'm going to kind of machine gun some knives. Boom, 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 boom. Because as you go through, you'll never see fear is defined in the Bible. No, you'll see faith is Hebrews 11 and one kind of getting ahead of myself, but all throughout the Bible, you're going to see what to not fear. Let's go with some of these knives. So Joshua one and nine, have I not commanded you commanded? not suggested. Have I not commanded you be strong and courageous? Do not be terrified or rot or dismayed, intimidated for the Lord, your God is with you wherever you go. Jeremiah one and eight, do not be afraid Yare of them. Do not be Yare of them or their hostile faces for I am with you always to protect you and deliver you, says the Lord. Matthew 10, 28. Do not be afraid, phobio, 
of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Do not, I'm going to say it again because that is so good. Do not be afraid, phobio, of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather be afraid of him, the Lord your God, who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Wow. <laughs> That's what you really should be phobio of. Another one, 1 John 4, 18. There is no fear in love. Dread does not exist. There is no fear. And I believe that fear is again, phobio. There is no fear in love. Dread does not exist. Perfect, but perfect, complete, full grown love drives out fear, phobio. Because fear involves the expectation of divine punishment. And so the one who is afraid of God's judgment is not perfected in love, has not grown into a sufficient understanding of God's love. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Lord. That's why I said you're going to want to rewind this because I'm going through it fast. But these are scriptures you always want to reference to. These are biblical definitions of fear. When to fear the Lord your God, when not to fear those who can kill the body, but not the soul, who to fear. These are biblical references to fear. So watch this. This is what really blows my mind. I mean, all of that blows my mind. But how do we practically define fear? So we, we have definitions of the Bible because the Bible isn't saying this is what fear is, but this is what you're not to fear. How do we practically define fear? It's so interesting. My, my mom, I don't know if she's watching tonight or she'll, she will be watching, but last week she had said we were talking about faith, right? We touched upon faith and we were talking about fear and she was like, false evidence appearing real. It's like, oh, she, she just went straight ahead into the next teaching because that's how, this is our first fork, right? How we define fear. You may have heard it before, but I'm going to put a spiritual twist on it. Fear, it's an acronym, false evidence appearing real. Oh, she is on tonight. Praise God. She said Isaiah 41 and 10 this is another scriptural reference. But yes, false evidence appearing real. Because faith is the evidence of things we hope for, which you can find in Hebrews 11 and 1. Fear is the false opposite of that. So if faith is your evidence, fear is false evidence. It's pretty straightforward how we're going to define this. But let me pose this question to you. Is fear an illusion? And the reason why I want you to think about this for a second is because I actually dug a little bit deeper, didn't have to go too far, but just go to your dictionary. The English definition, watch this, watch this closely. English definition of fear is an unpleasant emotion caused by the belief that someone or something is dangerous, likely to cause pain or a threat. And I said, highlight emotion and belief. I'll say it again. Our English definition of fear is an unpleasant emotion caused by the belief that someone or something is dangerous, likely to cause pain or a threat. That's how the English dictionary defines fear. Now watch this. The dictionary defines anxiety as a feeling of worry, nervousness, or unease, typically about an imminent event or something with an uncertain outcome. I want you to highlight feeling and uncertain. When I say highlight, remember these words because we're going to circle back to them. Anxiety, a feeling of worry, nervousness, or unease, typically about an imminent event or something with an uncertain outcome. Again, a feeling. We're going somewhere with this. Now watch this. The American Psychological Association, the APA, defines anxiety as an emotion characterized by feelings of tension, worried thoughts, and physical changes like increased blood pressure. People with anxiety disorders usually have reoccurring intrusive thoughts or concerns. They may avoid certain situations out of worry. I got to look at that again. The American Psychological Association defines anxiety. And here's, here's what I want you to highlight. It, this is how they define anxiety. An emotion 
highlight emotion, an emotion characterized by feelings, highlight feelings of tension, worried thoughts, highlight thoughts, and also comes with physical changes like increased blood pressure. People with anxiety disorders usually have reoccurring intrusive thoughts or concerns. They may avoid certain situations out of worry. This is what America is dealing with when it comes to anxiety, emotions, feelings, and thoughts. So when I was teaching this out a few years ago and we were doing this workshop, it was so cute. I had this like whole PowerPoint. I wish I could bring it to you. It's got I'm still working out how to do PowerPoints and lives at the same time. So I'm sure I can. But he, he, essentially, this PowerPoint was like a little like character emoji. And he was on this hamster wheel, right? And just going around and around. And it was this cycle. And it was this what I called um, just the cycle of emotions, or in this context, the cycle of fear and anxiety. But I want you to know, because this tonight we're talking about fear and anxiety versus faith and peace. This cycle could be either or. I put there's a vicious cycle of fear and anxiety, but that cycle can also be turned into a cycle of faith and peace. So you just go around and around and around. So if you bear with me for a second, so we're, we're going to start up here to the top and we're just going to kind of go in this motion, right? Because it keeps going around and around and around. So right at the top, you have fear is an emotion and it's fueled by belief, right? Just going directly to the definition which I agree with, it's an emotion. It is an emotion. But what is this emotion fueled by? It's fueled by a belief. Okay, so you come come over here. Belief is an acceptance of a thought as something true. So what do I believe what I believe? I believe it because I've accepted this thought that it's true, right? Truth can be perceived inaccurately by our sinful nature or correctly by the word of God. So a lot of times you're hearing this whole thing about what is truth? What is truth? I know I have my own truth. If you're sitting up there confessing what your truth is and it is not based in the word of God, it's a lie. I'm just telling you right now, the truth, the absolute truth is found in the word of God. However, in this cycle, if we have fear, that's an emotion and it's fueled by the belief. All a belief is black and white. It's just an acceptance of a thought being something true. You've accepted this thought. Oh, then that must be true. So that's why I believe it. Now that thought, that that truth that you have, it's perceived. It's a perceived truth that can either be perceived inaccurately because of our sinful nature, or it can be correct truth because we're discerning it by the word of God. We're, we're putting it under the light of the word of God. And we're saying this aligns with God's word. So it must be truth. So you got fear and motion fueled by belief. Belief is an acceptance as a thought of something true. That truth can be perceived inaccurately or correctly. That's why the cycle could be either or. And then when you receive that truth, reception of truth begins as a thought, whether it's right or wrong. When you receive truth, a thought, you can receive it from people. You can receive it from demonic influences. You can receive it from something you're telling yourself but you're receiving its truth as a thought. And that thought just pops right in your head. Emotions are always rooted in thoughts. And I'm over here now. So I'm like, do, 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 do. Your emotions are always rooted in your thoughts. If you're feeling sad, what were you thinking that day? If you're feeling happy, what were you thinking that day? If you're feeling depressed, what were you thinking about that day? Whatever you feel, it didn't just come out of nowhere. <laughs> Whatever you felt, when you got out of bed, there was something you thought that before your foot hit the floor, you were thinking it on when your head was on that pillow. Oh, this is going to be a horrible day. You already thought you're going to have a horrible day. So now how do you feel about that day? Pretty horrible. <laughs> and you haven't even started it yet. So emotions are always rooted in thoughts, which lands us right back to the beginning that fear is an emotion fueled by belief. So when we take this whole wheel, right, if if my emotions are fueled by my thoughts, if fear is an emotion and, and the emotion is fueled by belief, belief is acceptance of the truth, 
whether that truth is right or wrong, in this case, it's most likely wrong, um, then it's that truth is going to be that thought. And again, my thought is going to come out of that emotion. And then I'm right back with my emotion being fear. It ju- you just keep going around and around and around and around. And you're like, this is insane. <laughs> No wonder people are suffering from anxiety and fear. No wonder people are just, ah, they can't shut their brain off because they're just allowing their thoughts basically to fuel their emotions and their emotions to fuel their thoughts. You see where we're going with this? But you can do the same thing when it comes to the truth of God's word and peace. You can allow yourself to meditate on his word. I'm getting ahead of myself. But what I'm saying is you can choose this. I'm going back to my notes. The true moment of breakthrough, the true moment of breakthrough in the battle of the soul and mind is knowing that we can always choose what cycle to be in. I can be in a cycle of fear and anxiety and always looking over my shoulder and, uh, because I'm thinking, oh my God, this is going to happen. You just saw the definition. The defi- and let me see if I go back up of what fear is. An, un- an unpleasant emotion caused by the belief that someone or something is dangerous, likely to cause pain or a threat. So you're already afraid of a situation. And anxiety, anxiety is based on an uncertain outcome. <laughs> you're having feelings of worry, nervousness, unease. You're having these feelings because of a thought that came into your brain of some kind of truth that you thought was real. And that's why I asked you before, is this all one big illusion, being in fear? This is what I I really want you guys to think about. So going back, the true moment of breakthrough in the battle of the soul and the mind is knowing that we can always choose what cycle to be in. I can choose. Yes, you can. We will always choose to believe in something we cannot see. It will either be something real or false. And my notes actually say asking, will it be something real or false? You will always choose to believe in something you cannot see. Will it be something real or will it be something false? It takes the same amount of energy to have fear as it does faith. It takes the same amount of belief that something might happen bad as much as it is to have a belief that something might happen (laughs) by God's grace and goodness. Please understand that. And you can choose this day, am I going to believe in something that's real? What is real? I'm, I've got like 500 million Bibles around me. I'm growing up from my first Bible right here. This is real. This is real. If you ever like, what is real? This is. And you, everything you measure up in your life should be measured by the standard of God's word. So you can choose. Whether facing a spiritual attack of the fiery darts of the enemy or an intentional stronghold, I'm sorry, or an internal stronghold, um, battle of the mind, you can still choose your belief system. So this is what we're going to dive into tonight is discerning between the two, because when it comes to fear and anxiety that we wrestle with, that we struggle with, there is a fear and anxiety that comes from without, that comes from, you know, the world system that comes from, oh my gosh, there's COVID (laughs) that comes from people, um, the way things have been spoken over you. And then there's fears and anxieties that come from within. And that's what we're going to, we're going to kind of take our time and just kind of discern between the two. So we know, okay, this is what I'm dealing with over here. So I know how to attack that. This is what I'm dealing with over here. So I know how to attack this. This is such a good meal. This is so good. I'm telling you, it's going to get even better. Here we go. All right. So faith, as the Bible defines in Hebrews 11, I had um, kind of intimated to earlier, faith is defined in Hebrews 11. It is the assurance and I've taught this in previous sessions, it is the assurance, the title deed, confirmation of things hoped for, divinely guaranteed, and the evidence of things not seen. Oh, I have one more scripture put up. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and surely help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Amen. My mom said, yum, yummy for this meal. Praise God. (laughs) It's a good meal. It's a good meal. So here's how we know faith. Let me finish though. This is um, Hebrews 11 and 1 in the Amplified. 
Yes, I do love the Amplified. It amplifies what the word and the context is trying to say to us. So when it tells us what faith is, when it's faith is the assurance of things hoped for, assurance is your title deed. It's your confirmation. There it is. That's what faith is. You have confirmation for what you've hoped for. You have a divine guarantee. That's what your faith is. Faith is evidence of things not seen. And the things not seen is a conviction of our reality. Faith comprehends as fact what cannot be experienced by the physical senses. I'm going to say it again. Faith comprehends as fact what cannot be experienced by the physical senses. If you can see it, you don't need to have faith. That's, that's, that's the whole point. If you can see it, you don't need to have faith. That's why we need faith, because faith is what we don't see. It's our evidence, right? So the closest analogy to believing in something that exists but is not seen can be the wind, right? This analogy, it falls a little bit short because even the wind, you can feel it on your skin. You can feel if it's hot wind or cold wind. You can feel it. But ultimately, you don't see it, but you know it exists. Even if I didn't feel the wind, how would I know it exists? Because I see the evidence of the effects of wind. When it blows, I see the trees. I see the I see the effects of wind is doing. And so we must see in our spiritual eyes the effects of what faith is. Faith is dead being alone without works. We have to put works to our faith. So faith, that's it's that's this belief system. So this is one of my favorite analogies because those who know me know that I do have a secular job. This is just my passion and my love to bring these teachings to you. But yes, I do manage a health club. So a lot of my analogies have to do with health or whatever that looks like. But I say, imagine being sold a gym membership, right? What exactly are you purchasing when you purchase a gym membership? When we choose to believe in something or someone, it's because of the trust we have and how that information is being delivered. So when when someone walks into my club, you know, they're looking to purchase a gym membership. You're not purchasing anything tangible whatsoever. You're purchasing some kind of belief that if you go, you'll see results. <laughs> That's what you're purchasing. You're purchasing like, OK, I'm going to purchase this membership and I'm going to sign up. Because somewhere I have a belief system that I need to go consistently and I'll see the results that I'm looking for, whether that's a, a stronger heart, rehab after surgery, preparing for a marathon or a wedding, whatever that looks like. This is why you're purchasing the gym membership. You're not purchasing anything tangible, but a belief system. And when you walk through those doors, whether you've made up your mind or not, let's say you're not quite there yet. You meet the person who's going to give you a tour of the club. They're going to show you all the ins and outs, the equipment, and they're going to start telling you things and instilling more hope and faith that this is the answer and how it's being delivered to you when they're saying, oh, and then we have this and then we have our pool over here and we have, you know, this specific workout system over here. We have over 100 classes from high intensity to boxing classes, to tennis classes, to ballet classes, dance, hip hop. And the more you hear the more you start to realize this might be what I'm looking for. And so you go full on in and you get that gym membership, right? Because of what it's being delivered to you, you're trusting the person on the other side, what they're saying to you. And it's building your faith that you can do this. And that's just a gym membership. <laughs> so here's the thing. If that's how it's delivered, how is faith being delivered to us? Faith comes from hearing what is told and what is heard comes from preaching of the message concerning Christ. That's Romans 10 and 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's why I give you so much scripture. When I was reading those scriptures about do not be afraid, do, you know, God is with you. I am with you. I am with you. You're like, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. You keep hearing the word and it builds your faith. Keep coming to these kinds of teachings and listening and listening and listening. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. So why do people struggle having faith? That's, that's, that's my thing. I don't want to just give you all this teaching and, and let's, let's really get this fork out and eat and digest this thing. Why do people struggle having faith? Ask yourself that. If, it, if it's something for you or if it's something for a friend or a relative. And for me, there's obviously going to be 
um, many different reasons. And I kind of just had like three different umbrellas. But when it comes to things we cannot see, number one, trust is key. We have to be able to trust the source in which we are receiving the information to establish belief. I'm just looking at because <laughs> your part of your comment caught off, sis. You'll have to type it again. Um, but trust is key. That's number one. That's number one. People who struggle to have faith, trust has to be the source in which we are receiving the information. Amen. You have to have it. Amen. So be it. We have to be able to trust the source. So here's another knife. Proverbs 3 and 5. Trust in and rely confidently in the Lord with all of your heart and do not rely on your own insight or your own understanding. Trust can only come from relationship. So what what I, I, I want to kind of walk you through, but we'll take our time here for a second. This is this three compartments or three umbrellas that I see. There's three common obstacles to either having faith or holding on to faith. So I want you to kind of digest if, if you see yourself in any of one, three, or all of these buckets. First is relationship with God. The second obstacle is doubt in oneself or others. And the third obstacle is independence or ego. You could probably take just about anything that you feel like you're being challenged with and one of these obstacles is going to stand in your way if you're finding yourself struggling with having faith. That Hebrews 11.1, 1, faith. This is my faith that I have. Elizabeth says, yes, trusting when we can't see. Amen. Praise God. So let's just kind of break these down, shall we? So we have three common obstacles. Relationship with God, doubt in oneself or others. And third is independence or ego. So let's break down. First is relationship with God. Relationship with God is built just like a relationship you would have with a friend that becomes your spouse. That's exactly, it's the same exact thing. The Holy Spirit is a person. And the same way you would build a relationship with a friend who becomes your spouse is that same level or degree. So when I did this PowerPoint, it was, it kind of built on itself. So first it starts when you meet someone, when you first meet someone, right? You go on your quote, first date your coffee, you know, talk, go out to breakfast, whatever that looks like. It first starts with curiosity, asking questions. Oh, where are you from? What's your favorite color? What are your foods? What's your family like? You're, you're curious about the person in front of you. That's why you guys are dating. Something attracted you, drawn you in. So you're curious, you're asking questions in the spiritual context. That's right at salvation. The moment you become saved and you invite Jesus Christ into your heart and you're like, Lord, I love you. You should start getting curious, asking questions. Where is that in the Bible? I don't know this. What about this? How about that? This is your dating phase, if you will, right? So you go from dating right? You're asking these questions and you're kind of assessing, hey, I think we have a lot of things in common. And then that next level is courtship, right? Courtship means spending time to getting to know more of God. And when and, and in this same little analogy, right, you got that person in front of you, you're getting curious, you're asking all these questions, and you get more and more into this dating phase. And you and God are dating. You're dating the Holy Spirit. You're getting to, and the, how do you, how do you get to know someone by spending time with them? This is those people who are like all into each other and they're spending hours on the phone and you fall asleep on the phone at two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> That's this phase. You just can't get enough. And the more you spend time, the more you want to spend more time. It's just like, you know, you go from seeing this person from, you know, once every two weeks to once a week to spending every weekend with each other. Now it's like throughout the week, you see them every day. That's that's how you're building. And when you get to that relationship, once you're seeing this person every day, then it progresses, right? It progresses to an engagement. We're, we're going we're gonna to commit to each other. And that's where I said when this analogy in the same text with you and the Holy Spirit, this is where the relationship goes way beyond just religion. It's getting to know who he is and who you are in him and to him. And that's intimate. Wow. You've progressed to, okay, we're committed to each other. 
we're 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 engaged. We're not quite married, but but we're that's the direction we're going to. And that's that's the same kind of analogy when it comes to having a relationship with the Lord your God. When you're in this phase, right, in the same kind of lineup, this is where you're just getting to know not only who he is, and this is where I would lean into if I had more time and I could go into, you know, just really breaking this down how I did in the workshop. Um, I, I would invite you to, you can just Google or just look up the attributes of God, look up the many attributes of God. And I had like them listed like 20. There's so many, he's multifaceted in so many ways. But when you start to get to know who your God is, your God and who he is to you and what you mean to him, that's when you start to commit. That's when you go beyond. This is not just a religion. This is a relationship with the lover of my soul. And so finally, you get to the marriage, right? This, this, this whole progression leads to marriage, commitment, and an unshakable trust. That's when you know. If God says a thing, it's done. I, I know that I know that I know that I know that I am committed and I'm in a covenant that will not be broken. I had made a comment at the top of me doing like an intro to Rise Up and Remain Ministries. And I said with so much confidence that I am unstoppable. And I don't say that boasting in myself, because if it was myself, I, no, we would not be that bold. But I can say that by the spirit of God, because I have a covenant with the Lord, my God. He's got my back and my front and everything all around. And I know who I am in him. And I know who I am to him. I am the apple of his eye. And so are you. So if God says a thing, I trust it. I trust it. Don't even have to just what flinch. But if you find yourself in that area where you're kind of like, oh, I don't know. You just got to work on your relationship, right? Okay, let me keep going. The second umbrella, doubt right? This is another obstacle that can kind of get into our way when it comes to faith, having faith, keeping faith, doubt in oneself or others, right? When we have doubt in ourselves, it is oftentimes a source of lack of self-confidence or out of a habit of failure. Ooh, habit of failure. Oh, we're about to go deep now. <laughs> With either a source, doubt in yourself or others, right? So let's tackle doubt in yourself. Having a source of lack of self-confidence or out of a habit of failure. A lack of self-confidence can stem from negative repeated messaging from outside influences, family, excuse me, family, friends, or thoughts of low self-esteem that we tell ourselves. So if I have a repeated message, you're no good. You're an idiot. You're stupid. You're never going to win. You're never going to win. You're never going to win. I keep hearing this. No, I'm not going to have self-confidence. If I'm hearing it from others, if if I'm, you know, hearing it from, you know, outside sources and I allow it to come in because faith can come by hearing, but so can doubt. And in or I'm telling myself, why are you so stupid? Like, girl, like get it together. Like we tell ourselves the worst things in the world. I remember actually when I did teach this a few uh, years ago, I was, I was kind of with my group of ladies and I was saying, if you see yourself as your, the three-year-old version of yourself, because we do have our inner child, would you talk to a three-year-old the way you talk to yourself right now? That's how you can start to discern, am I dealing with negative self-talk? What am I telling myself? That would be horrible if I put it on blast on a microphone. That's, that's something you can start just asking the Holy Spirit to show you. What am I telling myself? Or what have I received from family and friends? What are we repeat? Oh, this is a great quote. What we are, what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act, but a habit. That's Aristotle. So here's the thing. It might not be out of Bible, but it's a really good quote. We are what we repeatedly do. We are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act, but it's a habit. This is so good. I want you to make sure. Uh, yeah, Latasha said negative self-talk. That's exactly what it is. We're going to be coming against that right now in the name of Jesus. <laughs> we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence is not an act, it's a habit. If excellence 
can be formed as a habit, so can failure. Or as I would say in this context, spiritual disciplines and sin can both be practiced as habits. Spiritual disciplines and sin is a practice habit. Let me give you another knife. Luke twenty two thirty nine, And he came out and went as his habit to the Mount of Olives and the disciples follow him. This is talking about Jesus. Jesus made it a habit to pray. He didn't have some natural blessing. Yes, he was the son of God. But it wasn't just, oh, he just prays when he wants to. He made it a habit to pray. Jeremiah 13, 22 and 23. This is on the opposite. And if you, this is the amplified, wander and say in your heart, why have these things happened to me? Is it because of the greatness and the nature of your sin that your skirts have been pulled away? That means subjecting you to public disgrace when your skirts have been pulled up. It was subjecting you to public disgrace. And like a barefoot slave, your heels have been wounded. Verse 23, can the Ethiopian change his skin or leopard his spots? Then you also can do good who are accustomed to do evil and even trained to do it. Wow. Evil and good can both be trained. We can have a habit of sin, a habit of failure, as well as a habit and a learned discipline of excellence, a spirit of excellence. So here's the thing. If we if we start a new thing, let's let's say, for example, you start a, a new project, a job, a relationship, a new task like cooking or Bible study, for example. I like cooking. Like, let's say you don't know how to cook and you want to take on a new project of how to cook. Right. You take something new on. You've never done it before. And initially you don't succeed in that. We can take the route of why try. I'm no good at this. Right. You just did it one time. Didn't have a great success. Maybe don't have the greatest, you, you re, pick up the Bible, you're like, I don't get it. Why even try? I'm no good at this. Especially if one has made the attempt multiple times. We have learned what failure looks like in an area and can make it a habit. Especially when we reinforce a false belief by speaking life to that with our mouths. Doubt in oneself can be born from past failures. So you keep failing at something over and over and over again. And then you're speaking. I'm no good at it. I'm no good at it. And you, you birth doubt in yourself. That's what you're doing. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And you're speaking death over something that you're no good at. And you're learning a habit of failure. I'm going to keep going. Doubt in oneself can be born from past failures, growing into a fear of failure and a lack of any hope for the future success. Fear is the enemy of faith. So here you have doubt being born and it growing into fear. That's what happens. You you doubt that you can do this. You doubt that you can do that. And now you're afraid to try anything ever again. You doubt that you're even really good at even communicating in relationships. So why try? I suck at relationships. I'll never be married. I'm afraid. You see where we're going with this? You see how the enemy even takes you down this path? But we set ourselves up for that. Because we don't have a spiritual discipline of faith, a spiritual discipline of getting in our word and believing what God says to be true. This is really good. And I hope you're shouting louder than what I'm teaching right now. This is so good. So I gave a few examples. Here's some examples of doubting in oneself. As Christians, this is how we doubt in ourselves. We say, God God can do it, but he can't do it through me. I believe in God, but I don't believe in myself. I don't trust in myself. These are the things we tell ourselves. Oh, yeah, I know God can do it, but can he really do it through me? I just heard a woman of God today, the devil just in her ear. And she she had the audacity to say, she knew she was wrong. She had the audacity to say, I know God's promises are real, but are God's promises for me? What? Girl, get out of here with them lies. <laughs> are God's promises for you? Doubt, fear, doubt. What are you telling yourself? The same can be said for others, for other people, or for outside circumstances beyond our control. And what does that sound like? I believe in God, but I don't believe in that person. They have let me down too many times. Oh, I I believe God can do it, but I don't know if he can do it. Mm -mm. Right? 
I'm doubting this person. They've hurt me. They've let me down. They've disappointed me. You want me to have faith for what, God? You want me to have faith for my broken marriage? And this man did A, B, C, D, and E, or this woman lied. And I, 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 I believe you, Lord. I believe in you. I believe you can do miracles, but not, not them, right? Or, or not in that circumstances, because uh, another example would be, there's no way this can happen. The facts presented are overwhelming, right? You, you believe in God, but that doctor's report isn't black and white. You believe in God, but that attorney just told you it's not going to happen. That quote loan didn't go through. The devil is a liar. I don't care what people say. What does God say? What does God say? Okay, so that's doubt in oneself or in others. A third obstacle that's common is independence or what I've also called ego, right? Um, I'm just, <laughs> my sister's just blowing up my comments. <laughs> Trump beats facts. I know, I know. So I love it too. I love it too. God is good in the name of Jesus. So independence, ego. Here's a third obstacle. How do we know when independence from God plays a role in hindering faith to fully develop in our lives. Let's ask ourselves that. Is, is, is ego or independence one of an obstacle I might be challenged with? What does that sound like? This is what it, this are some examples. Why wait on God when I can do it myself? Wow, ego. I don't need to have faith for provision. If I just work hard enough and save money, I must rely on myself. Now it's good to work. But if there are people who like bank money because that's what they rely on, they're independent. They don't need to rely on God. Independence. I don't need healing, just the right medication. Independence. Ego. These, these are some obstacles. Why have faith to be healed? Why have faith to, you know, get this provision of whatever that looks like when I can either just go ask this person or work really hard or get a second or third job? I can be independent. And, and this, this teaching might rub some people the wrong way because a lot of this whole world culture tells you independence is good. There's songs, movies, everything, worshiping independence. I'm independent, right? I can be bad by myself. The devil is a liar. You're entrapping yourself to not know what it means to rely on the Lord your God because that's why you need faith. Faith causes you, it drives you to rely on the Lord in every way. But if you have an ego and you have an independence, and some of us are struggling with certain areas of our lives, we'll believe God for this, we'll have God, we'll have faith in this, but we're going to have independence and ego in this area over here. And you know what that area is for you in your life. If this is something you struggle to have faith in, because all of these things will never serve you. And that's when fear and anxiety come into play. So in essence, what we're really saying in our hearts is why serve God when I can serve myself? That's what we're really saying. That's, that's what ego says. Proverbs 26 and 12. Do you see a man who is unteachable and wise in his own eyes and full of self-conceit? There is more hope for a fool than for him. Wow, the Bible be coming hard sometimes. <laughs> Proverbs 26 and 12. Do you see a man who is unteachable and wise in his own eyes and full of self-conceit? There is more hope for a fool than for him. Some of us, some, have such extensive roots of ego that reside so deep within the heart that left unexposed keeps us in a perpetual hamster wheel of attempting to have faith and struggling with receiving. So why bother to try and continue only to rely on self? So here is the fork to those three obstacles I just presented to you. Okay. If the opposite of a lack of relationship, if you're not, if you're working on your relationship, the opposite of a lack of relationship is intimacy. I kind of put here worship and I'll come back to that. The opposite of doubting is knowing the word. The opposite of independence is dependence and that's submission and inclusion. So let's just kind of take this bite by bite. If you find yourself struggling with one or two or even all three 
of the most common obstacles to having strong faith in your life. Here are some forks to digest this meal that's going to lead to peace because we broke down fear and anxiety. Now we're going to like, what do we need to do to get that faith and get that peace in our lives? So if you need more of an intimate relationship that I was talking about, those levels, and you want to go deeper in your intimacy, and you're like, I need a deeper relationship with God, so I trust him, and that's an obstacle to my faith, meditation and worship is the prescribed uh, prescription for you. Meditation and worship. Joshua 1 and 8 says, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall read and meditate on it day and night so that what so that you may be careful slow down for a second so that you may be careful to do everything in accordance with all that is written in it for then you will make your way prosperous and then you will be successful my favorite part about Joshua 1 and 8 is that it doesn't say that God will make your way successful <laughs> i know It says that you will make your way successful and that you will, you will make your way prosperous and you will be successful. When it says this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, that's number one, but you shall read and meditate that, that Hebrew word meditate is equivalent to when cows chew the cud right? They just chew and chew and chew and chew. And the more you chew, the easier it is to digest. When you read your word, you should be really thinking about what is it saying? Lord God, what are you saying to me in this moment, in this context? That's why the devil doesn't want you to read your Bible. He doesn't want you to even own a Bible. He wants you to maybe pick it up once a week. He's okay with that. And he's really okay if you try and pick it up and read it like you would read any other book. But whoa, The man or woman of God who says, Holy Spirit, reveal my spirit to your spiritual letter that you've written to me and help me read and understand and digest this thing and then apply it. That's the person who's unstoppable. That's the person the devil is afraid of. So working on an intimate relationship, meditate and worship the Lord your God. James 4 and 8 says, come close to God with a contrite heart and he will come close to you. So that's, that's number one. If you need more assurance because you're struggling with doubt, your prescription is to take your eyes off of inner self and other people and behaviors. Take your eyes off of it. Do not look at your past failures or those of others. Stop looking at it. That's what the enemy wants. He wants you. Oh, look what they did. Look what they did. Look at what you did. Remember when you did this? Colossians 3 and 2 says, set your mind and keep focus habitually. Mm, Thank you, Lord. Set your mind and keep focus habitually on the things above the heavenly things, not on things that are on the earth, which have temporary value or have temporal value. Set your things on eyes on things above and not on things around. This is the classic reason. If you are familiar with the story in, I want to say it's Matthew and in Luke, it might be in all four gospels where, you know, Jesus is walking on the water. They're in the midst of the storm and Peter sees Jesus on the water. And he's like, if that's you, Jesus, bid me to come. And Jesus is like, come, because it's me. <laughs> and Peter gets out in that boat out of faith, right? Because he was like, looking at Jesus. He's like, I'm coming for you. And all of a sudden, boom, crack, pow. There's that thunder. There's that lightning. And he's like, oh my gosh, there's a storm around me. And the moment he took his eyes off Jesus, he started to sink. Where was his faith? He still had it, but it was in front of him. He took his eyes off of it. So if you're having doubt, you need to get your eyes off of your past, their past, And be assured of what God says. What does God say? And Colossians 3 and 2 is your scripture. Set your mind and keep focus habitually. And that's why I stopped on habitually. Because there's a lot of you who do set your mind on Christ, but not habitually. I've said to some of you who I disciple that I've had the pleasure of knowing, I've said, sweetheart, you're doing all the right things. You just need to be more consistent in doing them. That's some, for some of you, that's the key. You're not doing anything wrong. But are you doing the right thing more and more of it? 
So set your mind, keep focused habitually on the things above, the heavenly things, not on things that are on the earth, which have only a temporal value. Now, if your struggle is, you know, independence and ego, and you need more dependence, when I talk, talk about submission to his will, submission is not a dirty word. There's power in submission. I thank God for submission. Submission is gives you freedom. So we talked about last week, ask. That's simple enough. Just ask for it. A-S-K, ask him and learn a habit of waiting. And that was Matthew 7 and 7. We talked about ask and keep on asking and it will be given to you. Seek and keep on seeking and you will find. Knock and keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. Because the whole thing about independence and ego is you don't ask. Think about it this way. How humbling is it when you have lack and a family member has something that could help you and you don't want to ask them? That's pride. That's ego. You have to humble yourself and say, can you help me? Wow. And that's what God is saying to that independent, egotistical pride is humble yourself and submit to me. When I talked about inclusion, this was kind of some of my notes that I didn't get a chance to put up there. It says, um, we have, we must establish intimacy. We must know our God and know who we are in Christ Jesus. And we must submit to the Lord and include him more and more in every part of our life and decision. That's the inclusion. Independence and ego excludes God from making a decision. You just do it. Did you even stop to ask him? Well, I ain't going to ask him because I'm independent. I have an ego. Pride doesn't even allow me to stop and think. But if I have to ask God for something, that means I have to have faith in asking. And I also have to have faith I'll receive an answer. Now, mind you, it might not be the answer you want, but he will answer you because he is faithful to you. And that's why I'm I'm encouraging you to go look up those attributes. I didn't have a lot of time. I think I almost got us right into an hour. But if I were here all night, I'd be like, oh, and here are all the attributes. And with every attribute of God, there is a promise that you can trust and rely on him for. Every facet of who he is, as Jehovah Jireh, for example, is the name of God who provides. That is an attribute of who God is. If he is a provider, then my faith says he will provide for me. But if I don't have faith because I don't know that about him, if I don't know that about him, how would I believe it to be true? So start looking for who he is in your life. Develop, cultivate that intimacy in your life. Um, seek him out in meditation and worship in the name of Jesus. And keep coming back to these types of, you know, sessions and teachings and keep hearing, hearing, hearing. That's how that faith is going to build, build, build. And perfect, mature faith cast out all fear. Remember, fear is just an illusion. It's just false evidence and faith is real evidence. Anxiety is just an emotion, an emotion that comes from a thought. And you can always change your mind. Praise God. Renew your mind. Amen. By the word of God. So yes, come visit us on uh, riseupandremain.com. We have a whole bevy of options of other studies you can come to. You can put your re prayer request in there. You can join us on links when we pray. We have an amazing time there. And if you really, really just got something out of this video, please like it. Please like it right? Like the video. I'm going to, if this is a recording, like it. If you're here with me live, what I would love for you to do is after this live, I'm going to post this when it goes into the record mode, like that video to get the recording up, right? Share it. Some of you already have given me testimonies of those that you've shared this with. And if you haven't already subscribed, subscribe to Rise Up and Remain and then click that notification bell. So every time we go live, you're not going to miss it. Anytime I post a video, you're not going to miss it. And I just thank you so much for supporting us. I'm, I'm, And yeah, put your comments up. Thank you for your comments tonight. We had a good time. And hopefully you got full on this meal. Now you got to go burn it off. Work off those calories. How do you burn it off? By teaching it out to the next sister and brother in Christ who needs to hear it. 
Amen. Amen. All right, let's close out in prayer. Father God, I thank you so much, Lord, for this good, good teaching. Let this seed be sown and planted and not be plucked out by the cares of this world, by the enemy himself, or even our own mouth speaking lies against this truth. I thank you, Father God, that this is seed sown in good soil in the name of Jesus. This is seed sown that you will provide the increase, Lord God, increase of faith, increase of peace in our lives, a peace that passes all understanding in the name of Jesus. I thank you that we come against fear. We thank you, Lord God, that you have not given us a spirit of fear, but you have given us a spirit of power, of love, and a sound temperate mind. I thank you that these are the promises we stand on. And having done all to stand, we continue to stand in Yeshua's name. In Jesus' name we pray. We say amen and amen and hallelujah, amen. I love you guys. Have an amazing day, evening, afternoon. And I will see you here next Friday. Oh, what are we talking about next? Next week, next, next, next uh, channel coming up. We're on week seven. Week seven. Woo! As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. I love this teaching. The mind, heart, and mouth connection. They're all connected. What are you talking about, Sharaka? You better come back and check it out. <laughs> and we'll deal with it then. All right, have a good one. Bye.